for a statewide uh, water policy committee. I'm serving on the committee for Martin County. And I'm really, really encouraged uh, by what I'm hearing, from, particularly from the governor's office. Uh, Dr. Rand said, if you're going to agitate, agitate with the governor's office. I agree with you. Uh, the governor has been crystal clear since he was inaugurated that his signature issue, uh, that his legacy issue is going to be water. Two and a half billion dollars worth of water improvement projects in the next four years. Um, so, one would think that given a governor who right out of the, the gate says water is going to be my single most important issue, wouldn't you think that the legislators would have filed a bunch of bills that they knew that this governor would sign. They haven't. They, signed, they, they filed about four bills. One of them is more lackluster than the other. It's, uh, it's really disappointing because this is the opportunity that we've been looking for for decades. To have a governor who's going to support environmental regulations. Um, so I, I, the, the governor spoke on Thursday morning. He was unequivocal about his support for water quality in Florida. He understands that the economy will dissolve around us if we don't clean our water up. He recognizes that there are polluters and that we need to stop polluters. So I'm very encouraged. I'm encouraged by his, his, uh, his efforts to replace the Water Management uh, Governing Board. He appointed a new um, executive director who will take things in the right direction if he's allowed to. Um, he has the, if he has the political will to make the correct decisions, he will make them. Um, the uh, secretary of the DEP is, is doing a fine job. Um, they're, they're saying the right things, and I think that they're in earnest, and they're going to do everything that they can in order to turn things around in Florida so that we can continue to enjoy a high quality of life here instead of watching uh, things deteriorate. Maggie's glass is always half full, mine is usually half empty. I've heard, this is about the sixth time that I've heard uh, Dr. Brand talk. I go to the Everglades conferences each year, and he generally speaks there. Every time I, I, I hear him speak, I want to head for the hills. Today is no exception. Thank you. Well, thank you all for hanging in there. Um, I promise you this is not going to be death by PowerPoint. I, I, uh, I, they gave me 20 minutes. I think I can do it in a lot less than that because uh, Larry covered a lot of the things I was going to say. Um, so, mostly I have some data I want to share with you. you. You guys all know the situation we're in from what was, has been called the most biologically diverse estuary in the United States to um, signs like these um, that are, are not doing our economy any good whatsoever. Um, we have a lot of algae blooms in Florida uh, and as Larry pointed out, um, there are a number of different species. The three that are probably most prominent for us uh, around here um, have been what are called red tide, brown tide, and blue green algae. Uh, the red tide is the dinoflagellate currently in brevis that he spoke of. Brown tide is what hit in the northern part of the lagoon. Um, it doesn't produce a toxin, but it was present in such large numbers that when it died, the microbial action sucked all the oxygen out of the water and killed a lot of fish. Um, and then blue green algae, which isn't algae at all, but cyanobacteria, and microcystis is um, one of the worst culprits. And so the red tide and blue green algae are the ones I want to address right now because of the toxins that they produce. Any of you that were here in October um, and experienced that red tide, you know how really horrible it was. This was on my beach in North Hutchinson Island. It was an unbelievable. That sand mound that you see in the background is how they handled it. They came out with earth moving gear and, and piled all the dead fish into these burial mounds every hundred yards. And actually, when I saw it, I thought, that's a really dumb idea. And actually, it turned out to be a really smart idea. Um, because it kept down the smell and the flies, and then by the time the tide came in and pulled them out, the fish sunk. Um, so the health impact on everybody was a lot less because they did that. What you're seeing there is just what came up on the beach after they formed those bur burial mounds. So this was an incredibly deadly red tide, um, absolutely miserable for anybody that's ever experienced it. 300 yards from the beach, when I got out of my car um, to walk over and take those pictures, I had to put on a mask because it, it just gets you right in the center of your chest. So 
uh, it's not the first time this has happened. The red tide on the west coast has swept around to the east coast. It, get, it gets carried on the loop current. It's happened um, about eight times since the 1950s when it, they first started documenting it. Um, the last time I think was more than 10 years ago. Uh, usually, you know, it doesn't stick around here, it gets carried away by the Gulf Stream. Um, but this one was absolutely the most deadly that we've ever seen. Um, the reason these things are called red tides is that in species in California and in New England, they actually do turn the water red. Our red tide actually turns the water gold. Um, but it's colorful, uh, nonetheless, um, as is our blue-green algae um, events. Uh, they have been plaguing the Lake Okeechobee, Caloosahatchee, and the St. Lucie Estuary. So, as Larry pointed out, um, microcystis produces a toxin called microcystin, uh, unbelievably toxic molecule, um, and tough. You can boil this sucker, it doesn't denature. Um, it attacks the liver, we know a fair amount of that, about that because of um, data from China where a lot of their water has been contaminated with microcystin. Um, and so it has both acute and chronic effects. The acute effects, we, those of us that have been around it um, during recent blooms in the St. Lucie Estuary can attest to. I went down there twice to, to sample, and um, both times I don't think I was around it for more than 15 minutes. I was close to it, but I was around it for about 15 minutes. I was sick for 24 hours afterwards. Just headache, nausea, just miserable. And, you know, people living next to it, I'm sure it was far, far worse. The amazing thing is how toxic it is in very low concentrations. So the World Health Organization sets the limit in drinking water at one part per billion. That's the equivalent of one drop in a tanker truck full of water. Um, they set the recreational exposure at 10 parts per billion. So uh, the question is, you know, how much do we need to be concerned about this apparent increase in these blooms in our local waters? Well, there was a study done by Ohio State University in 2015 where they looked nationwide for um, the incidences of uh, toxic algae blooms and the co-occurrence with um, non-alcohol related liver disease. So they just combined two national data sets and any place they found a high correlation, they put a red spot. And you'll know there's one red spot in Florida and it's right here around Lake Okeechobee and the Indian River Lagoon. Should we panic? No. First of all, it's always important to remember that correlation is not causation. Just because the number of ice cream sales and shark attacks co-occur in July is not reason to think that they have anything to do with each other except that they both tend to bring people to the beach um, and, and enjoy the hot weather. Um, and there are many other spurious correlations, some pretty funny ones that you can find online involving um, Nicholas Cage and Force rates, I think it was, I can't remember, but anyways. Um, so you, you have to be careful, but, but you do want to recognize that it could be cause for concern. So our question at ORCO was, you know, what are the possible paths of exposure and how can we look at it? So um, paths of exposure are obviously in drinking water. They had a big problem with this in Lake Erie. In fact, they had a, a number of issues, but August 2014 was the uh, most extreme where they had a microcystis bloom so massive it could seem to be seen by satellite. Um, the Toledo water inlet looked like this, uh, and they had to shut down water supply to half a million customers. And this was not a boil notice, this was a do not touch notice. This was extreme. Um, you can also be uh, exposed to it through aerosolization, uh, as any of us who have been around it well know. Um, and the Harbor Branch did a study where they uh, tested people with no swabs, um, and this was uh, not what you would call an unbiased set because these were volunteers, obviously, people that thought they might have been exposed. And 100% of those had positive uh, results with microcystin in the no, on the no swabs. Um, so aerosolization is, is another way you can get exposed to it. Uh, it can be taken up in our food crops. Um, the microcystins uh, are taken up by quite a number of different food crops. Um, we may be more prone to that here in Florida because of our agriculture. We created agricultural land by draining the swamp and creating these canal systems to do so, and then we irrigate our crops from those canals. Well, those canals turn out to be pretty ideal places for harboring uh, cyanobacteria. 
Um, and we found this uh, in 2014. We got funding from the state to put up uh, 25 of our water quality monitors in all of the major canals and tributaries feeding into the Indian River Lagoon. Um, unfortunately, we had to pull them out, uh, and we're left with just 10 in 2017 because of funding cutbacks, but we're hopeful that this new governor might um, allow us to put more out again. Um, because we were discovering a lot of pretty interesting things. For example, um, we were seeing what we were calling these cryptic blue-green algae blooms, and this goes to uh, one of the questions that was asked earlier about what, whether you can count on just being able to see the algae as a, an indication that it's present. No, you can't. So we were seeing um, evidence on our detectors, our Kilroy's uh, can test for blue-green algae, um, even when there was absolutely no evidence of blue-green algae uh, at the surface. And so this was in the C23 canal, which is used to irrigate crops. So our question was, okay, when you're looking at a, a problem in science, it's, uh, it's important, first of all, often to repeat your book results to make sure um, that they're believable in your context. And so the first thing we did was just a, a very super quick experiment where we just wanted to see um, if we could actually measure microcystin in food crops that had been exposed um, during irrigation to microcystin. So we set up a real simple experiment um, where we had uh, uh, lettuce seeds. The control is just water on the right. On the left is 10 um, uh, parts per billion of microcystin. Um, and the obvious thing that popped out of us was that the crop yield was way down. And we repeated this a couple of times in a couple of different ways with different uh, crops. And, and, and much larger end values and saw it again and again and it turns out actually this has been seen um, in uh, a, a lot of literature now is coming out about this in December 2017 this was a publication in Food Research International where they were showing microcystin taken up by lettuce, carrots and green beans and um, on the right you're seeing the crop yields so uh, this is under zero parts per billion. This is one part per billion, five parts per billion, ten parts per billion. Those are all very low levels. I mean, we've been finding higher levels than that pretty often. Um, and the this is the <coughs> lettuce, carrots, and green beans. And you can see the crop yield is dropping uh, to the point you know the green beans are small and low number and shriveled. So what does a farmer do when he sees his crop yield going down? He has more fertilizer which feeds the algae plume, which creates more microcystin. So I've been trying to get in front of the agricultural community, who doesn't really want to talk to anybody that has anything to do with environmentalism, but to let them know, uh, and I have talked to Nikki Freed, um, and you know, we're trying to get this knowledge out there because this could be impacting how the farmers are handling their crops, um, that, that they need to be aware that this may be impacting them to a much greater degree than they might rather realize, otherwise realize. Then the other most obvious way that it could be getting into our um, systems is uh, by bioaccumulation. Um, and so when you've got um, plankton that are being consumed by small fish, that they, they concentrate the plankton that has the uh, toxin in it, and then medium-sized fish concentrate it further, and the game fish concentrate it further. So by the time you get up to these big fish, the concentration levels of whatever the toxin is, be it methyl mercury or microcystin, um, can become quite substantial. And it turns out that, as Larry pointed out, um, both brevitoxin and microcystin do bioaccumulate. Um, the, uh, uh, originally, it was thought that the red tide toxin um, might not bioaccumulate because it kills the fish so fast that they, they thought there was no chance for that. But then in 2004, there was this mass mortality of dolphins up in the panhandle, and when they assayed them, they discovered that they did have microcystin in their flesh, and they had menhaden in their bellies that had a lot of microcystin in the flesh of the fish. Um, so brevitoxin actually can bioaccumulate. Um, and so we wanted to know to what extent microcystin was bioaccumulating in our local fish. Um, and so we started, um, capturing fish um, and doing microcystin assays in their livers, uh, fillets, we actually even tried to do it in their, um, uh, their skin, which is a lot tougher. Um, 
but um, this was a study that was funded by the Guardian, Guardians of Mount, Martin County. Um, we're very grateful for that, to them for uh, making this study possible because it pr produced some pretty interesting results. Um, this is what is known um, as a convenience sampling um, in that, uh, you know, we, it was sort of like the Harbor Harbor Branch nose um, swab study. It's a first cut at, at just trying to figure out, are do any fish have microcystin in it? So we were just taking fish from anybody, uh, from anywhere we could get them. And it was actually proved to be rather difficult because there had been these toxic algae blooms and uh, the fishing was very poor. Um, <clears throat> but we got 51 fish. Um, and in um, these that you see here, the green is in from the fillet and the red is from the liver. Um, there are absolutely no detectable microcystin in these. This is just the number of fish here, not the concentration. Um, th this is just barely detectable. It, I mean, we know it's there, but it's so low that you can't really uh, quantify it accurately, but we included it because it does seem to show a continuum. Um, and then this was with microcystin present always higher in the liver, which is not too surprising because um, that's the uh, detoxification organ for us and for fish. Um, so how much is the microcystin in the liver and the fillets of these fish? Um, <clears throat> well, <clears throat> the average concentration, <clears throat> sorry, in the fillet, <clears throat> was 7.4 with a range of 0.8 to 39, pretty big range, and, and the liver was 17.2. So what does that mean? <clears throat> well, um, if you look at what the World Health Organization sets as the limit in a 155-pound person, um, <clears throat> they set it at 2,800 nanograms. That's based on 40 nanograms per kilogram of body weight. Um, and so how does that relate to the 7.4? Well then, an 8 ounce serving of a filet would give you 1,800 nanograms. So, you know, by the World Health Organization standards, that's probably okay. Um, and, but, if you happen to eat that fish, which by the way was an armored catfish, so most people would be safe, um, <clears throat> it would be a much, much higher dose. Uh, and but that's, you know, part of our question is, uh, who eats what?